So I wanted to introduce myself. I'm so excited to see all of you here today. This is a, a very exciting event for us here at the Digital Media Zone. Um, this is a connection event. And uh, to see all of you here makes us really, really happy. I'm Valerie Fox. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Digital Media Zone. And again, it's such a pleasure to see all of you this morning. And now it's my pleasure to offer the podium to Joanne, to jo Joanne Fideko, Executive Director of the C100 and a great enabler of Canada's high potential entrepreneurs. Welcome, Joanne. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, first of all, thank you so much to DMZ Ryerson Futures for incorporating C in 2020 into Accelerate Toronto, which is our annual technology conference. For those of you who don't know the C100, um, we're based out of San Francisco. We're a membership-driven organization. We're here to support you, <laughs> entrepreneurs, um, through membership of, uh, through access to our partners, our um, access to capital, um, opening up the c connections that we have down, um, down there in the valley. Um, since taking on the role of executive director a few months ago, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of people. Some I can't remember their names, obviously. Um, but all this group that's an amazing part of uh, the growing community of supporters here in Canada. Um, this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing one such amazing business leader who um, probably needs no introduction in this room. John Ruffalo is the chief executive officer of Omer's Ventures, the venture arm of Omer's. Omer's Ventures invests in early to late stage companies in technology, media, and telecommunications. He's also the Senior Managing Director of Knowledge Investing with Omer Strategic Investments. Prior to joining Omer's, John was partner at Deloitte, as well as global thought leader, global tax leader, and Canadian industry leader for Deloitte's technology, media, and telecommunications practice. And get this, John was recently named the most powerful business person by Canadian Business Magazine. I think that's pretty amazing. His influence extends beyond his role at Omer's onto numerous boards, including the board of Communitech, and is also a member of the Toronto chapter of the Young Presidents Organization. And uh, while we meet here today in Toronto, John, I don't know where he is, I just want to say next time you're passing through San Francisco on your way to the wine country, I hope you'll give me a call. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming John. Thank you very much, uh, Joanne, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, waking up early. I know I was thrilled to wake up early as well, so uh, I appreciate it. Take uh, get some coffee. Um, what I'll do is that I will speak for uh, about 20 minutes and then please uh, to take any questions that you might have. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Always thrilled to be in the, in the DMZ. There's such great things happening here. It is quite amazing to see what is actually happening in Toronto uh, today with so much things like the DMZ, whereas only you know, four or five years ago, you couldn't actually name any uh, sort of organization like this. So it's, it's quite thrilling. So, you know, what, what I want to talk about is, is really the future, your future, our future, the future of Canada. And I have a few um, areas that I just really want to uh, push the pedal on and, and perhaps, uh, you know, get some of the, the creative uh, juices uh, flowing. And, you know, I, I'm really excited about the future, uh, and, and particularly the future of this country. And I think right now, the future for the innovation sector really is now. And now is the time, and I would say finally, uh, you know, we've gone through this nuclear winter after the dot-com bust, and the innovation sector really took a back seat in this country. And, but now is the time to bust forward and to really uh, make our mark. Now, Canada has a lot to be proud of, and, and I, I really believe it, that we live on the greatest nation on earth. But to keep this nation great for us, for our children, for our children's children, we need to make sure that we have a progressive, comprehensive, cohesive, and sustainable industrial strategy to propel Canada ahead in the 21st century. And I believe that innovation is one of those key pillars for an industrial strategy for Canada. We also need to recognize that Canada can no longer be all things to all people from an industrial policy perspective. We need to focus, we need to choose, and we need to compete on a global level like we've never seen before. 
And I believe that we actually have as a nation the assets to make this happen. And just like what we're seeing in the DMZ, it's already happening. You know, we have the human capital, the education, the infrastructure, a growing ecosystem, incubators, accelerators, uh, more uh, uh, sources of risk capital now that we've seen in the last uh, number of years. But now is the time to push the pedal on the gas and then watch us all go. Now, there's three areas that I want to uh, zero in on. The first one uh, is around clustering, and I do believe in cluster theory. The DMZ is an example of cluster theory at work. Now, when we look at developing a national strategy around innovation, I think the way to actually execute it is around cluster theory. And when you look in Canada, there is five cities that are really driving most of the activities. And it's Vancouver, Kitchener-Waterloo, Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. I can tell you, just by virtue of the deal flow that we get from Omer's Ventures, those five cities represent over 90% of all of the opportunities that we see. And the key is to, to strengthen the nodes in each one of those five cities. It doesn't mean exclude the rest of the cities in Canada, but if you want to move forward, you got to drive it on where your strengths are. And, and I think when you look at each of those five cities, if you look at the pillars of education, human resources, capital, infrastructure, et cetera, each one of those elements need to be strengthened in each one of those cities. And many of you here today are actually from uh, one of those clusters. A few points on the, on the clustering. Number one, we collectively need to be very vocal in each one of those clusters. And we need to be heard. We should not be looking for any public handouts, by the way. And this is my view. I, you know, it's not about government or the public sector leading the way. It's our collective responsibility. The public sector or governments, they are certainly there to help leverage but it is the private sector that needs to make the bets, needs to make the resource allocations. You know, I would even go further. We need to cut any whining. You know, I, I do hear whining, and it drives me insane. As I, it's your responsibility if you're an entrepreneur. If the capital is not here, shame on Canada. You gotta go out and you gotta find it. You gotta go out and find the people. Don't blame others for, for any frustrations that you feel. Entrepreneurship is hard. It's really, really hard. That's why when you go and you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, I think the press makes it too sexy and easy and all this glamour. It really is a hard, a hard task. So when you go in it, just recognize it for what it is. Going back onto the, uh, onto the uh, uh, clustering, you know, the other point that I'd say is, as Canadians, we tend to look down upon what we already have. When I mentioned those five cities, three of those five cities were named as three of the top 20 in the world to build a startup. If you have read the Genome uh, Project uh, study, not perfect study, but the point is, when I go around in the world, people talk about the innovation that's going on in Canada it seems to be whenever I hear the negativity, it happens to be Canadians. It's not outside of Canada, you know, go figure. And once we continue to build these clustering, and, and, and right now we're starting to see it, you know, we have DMZ, we have Mars, we have uh, 111, all kind of coming down into the core where people will congregate around that cluster. Professional services uh, uh, individuals will do the same thing, corporates, et cetera. Once we strengthen each cluster, the next step in the evolution is to start to link the clusters and to start to strengthen it like two nodes at the end of a, of a point and, and drawing a line across it. And the first cluster that we're actually trying to link is Kitchener-Waterloo in Toronto, largely due to its proximity, but, it, but it's quite fascinating to see what Toronto is weak in uh, KW has some great strengths and vice versa. And once you start to look at 
uh, linking those two clusters together, get a super cluster, you can then start thinking about building infrastructure along those clusters, in particular transportation. You know, another point is, is that when we're thinking about clustering in, in, in the cities in Canada, one thing to keep in mind, another city in Canada is not the competition. It's Canada versus the world. And I think that, you know, when I, I see this pettiness going on between uh, let's protect, you know, territories in Toronto or KW, et cetera, it's all nonsense. Uh, when you add the two together, you get something greater than the sum of its parts. And I think that if we're to have any chance to really be globally competitive, it really needs for us to be Canada versus the world. And like I said, in Toronto, I'm seeing great things happening. Joanne just mentioned all of the incubators working together. Uh, like that is phenomenal. Like that actually uh, is relatively a, a newer development, one that I'm absolutely thrilled about. The next issue is around uh, the entrepreneur. I am really excited about this. What we're witnessing is the rise of the entrepreneur in Canada. You may not think that's significant, but, and I'm older than most of you here, when I graduated or thinking about graduating from university, I was molded all through uh, uh, elementary to high school and ultimately university to be a professional. Success was equated to being a doctor, lawyer, accountant, banker, pretty much. Uh, uh, not even so much engineer for some reason, and maybe that was just the way that I, uh, I grew up. But to, to be an entrepreneur, and I remember one individual in my class, my graduating class, actually said, I want to be an entrepreneur. My reaction was, yeah, I think you should. You weren't very bright, actually. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. A number of other folks later on would say to me, they told their parents they were going to be an entrepreneur, and the, uh, the parents freaked on them. And it's interesting. When you look, particularly in Silicon Valley, I would say not fully the U.S., the entrepreneur sits at the epicenter. We're starting to see that uh, in Canada. We're not there yet, but it's fascinating and exciting to see. Reason why this is really important, I think we're one generation away where the whole notion of what it means to be an, employ an employee is going to change, and it's going to change dramatically. I think we're going to have to be a nation of entrepreneurs. And when I say entrepreneurs, you whether you, you build your own company or not, you will be a subcontractor. You will either subcontract your skills to another company, or you will build your own company and subcontract the skills of others. And, and if you accept that notion, it is going to be entrepreneurship that's going to actually have to lead the way. It's not going to be about some corporate entity taking care of you. And in order for us to get there, we need to treat entrepreneurship like a profession, like, it, like the other ones that were treated to me back when I was graduating. And I think it needs to be introduced as early as possible in our formal education so that we are already thinking about entrepreneurship uh, at, at the very youngest uh, ages. The other thing about entrepreneurship is you know, we need to celebrate entrepreneurship even more, but not necessarily for the successes, but, but also for the failures. The, the, celebrating successes is really, really easy. And if you want to do that, just read TechCrunch and you'll get all the successes. It, it ignores 99.9% .9 of what's really going on there. And what actually fascinates me more is that when I hear and understand the, the, the grueling and tiring work and, and sometimes the dark moments uh, uh, for the entrepreneur. That to me is a moment of celebration. And I think we need to accept failure and embrace it for what it really is. It's just a learning opportunity. And we need to wear failure as a badge of honor and not hide from it as an emblem of shame. 
The next part about entrepreneurship that, again, gets me very excited is the cultural diversity of our entrepreneurship. This is an advantage that Canada has over the world. I mean, I look around here, I can see the diversity. Uh, we don't have a comparable study in Canada, but in the U.S., now this is a, a, a year dated, 61% of the founders of technology-based companies in Silicon Valley were funded by, a, uh, by an immigrant. I, phenomenal. And I think this asset is one that we need to continue to hold on to and to actually lever even more. And in fact, this culture, cultural diversity is actually what's setting us apart from the U.S. In fact, when you look at the U.S. immigration policies, they've been going the other way. And in Canada needs to lever on this. In fact, the U.S. is taking note of some of the great things that Canada is doing from an immigration policy perspective, whether it's the startup visa or the immigrant investor program. And the last thing, it's hard not to say, we've got great education in this country in order to help support the entrepreneurs. We're at Ryerson. Where Ryerson has gone in the last number of years under the leadership of Sheldon Levy is like unbelievably dramatic. This school, like Sheldon is entrepreneurial. This school is entrepreneurial. That just did not happen you know, five years ago. I couldn't point to a university that was, that was embarking upon this. So it's quite exciting. And, and you know, when I look around the room and I see the entrepreneurs here, like, you just cannot help but get very, very excited. So my last point is really to get involved. And I think you can get involved in many different ways. I just talked about the entrepreneur. Not everyone is an entrepreneur, and, and not everyone likes being an entrepreneur. But there's so much other value you can add. You can work for a startup. You can supply capital to fund the startup. You can supply professional services, legal accounting, human resources, banking. You can work in a large corporate organization that supports the startup, whether as a customer, whether as a future acquirer, whether as a strategic relation partner. There is a massive ecosystem. And all those elements of the ecosystem, think of it as rings, are all necessary in order to create a successful innovation ecosystem. But it does start at the entrepreneur, because without the entrepreneur, the rings around it won't, won't form. But whatever you do, just do one thing. Be loud and be proud. We need to have the public know that you are here. We need our policymakers to know that we are building the future of Canada. And we can't remain Canada's best known secret. As I said earlier, we do live in the greatest country on, the, uh, on earth. We have been blessed with what this country has provided us. It is now time to think about our long-term future from an industrial strategy perspective. And we need to allow our children and our children's children to enjoy the same or better standard of living that we have enjoyed. And once Canadians, generally speaking, know we are an innovation nation, an innovation nation, the rest of the world will know we are here to kick some ass. Thank you very much. So I have a. Oh, oh, would, would were you, you going to have questions first? Okay. Sorry. Sure. Yes. Uh, anybody have any? Uh, do we have any? Do we have time for questions? Yep. It was okay. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, please. Yes. It's a really good question. Um, let me try to answer it this way. Generally speaking, uh, from a marketplace perspective, and you're figuring this out, uh, the Canadian market represents a small proportion, ultimately, of the revenues that, that, that uh, most startups enjoy, with, with some limited exception. 
In fact, it's one of the problems, and I, why I mentioned on the corporate side, you will see particularly the U.S. corporates are more amenable to uh, engaging the services of a startup than, than Canadians are. That, that is an absolute fact. Now, the practical problem is, is that you know, when you're very early stage startup and you're still trying to get to your MVP and, and you're still doing A-B testing and you're not quite sure and you need one or two reference accounts, typically uh, uh, from a proximity and trust perspective, it may be easier for you to engage with a Canadian customer. But there is a point where, and, and, and not necessarily so, if you, if you immediately jump to a customers uh, outside of Canada, particularly the US, that's, that's great. I find it harder for people to do so unless you otherwise have some sort of a relationship or ability to get into those companies. But if you don't, it is okay to, to, to reference Canadian customers so that you actually have a live customer to actually test your product. But at the end of the day, in order for you to scale, it's generally not going to be Canada. So you're going to have to figure out pretty quickly on, you know, once I start to get some reference customers, how do I jump to another jurisdiction? But how do I do that in a relatively efficient way? And if you choose to remain in Canada, which I hope that most do, what typically starts to happen is that first hire in the U.S., tends to be either a business development or a sales type person close to where the market actually is because they got to be there. And, and I think that is you know, typically uh, the, the, the right uh, balance. Any other questions? Oh, so yes, please. Sure, um, and, and, and you did a good job of qualifying already. There is tons of capital in this country. It's risk capital that you qualified, which is the right uh, narrowing of the, of the definition. Personally, I think that at the early stage of the marketplace, there has been a lot of new sources of, of capital, whether it's angels, super angels, incubators, accelerators, et cetera. And not saying it's perfect and not saying that there's not some companies that should be funded that are not, but there's not, uh, in my view, there's not a ton that don't find that financing. The issue starts to come when you hit about a Series B. And in particular, when you want to get a check for at least $10 million or greater from a single entity, that is a massive hole in this country. That's been a hole for, frankly, as long as I've been in this business. And, and frankly, when you look at the strategy of Omer's Ventures, not only did we go at the very beginning of the cycle, but cutting checks, 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollar check sizes was, was, was frankly an opportunity for us to come in with very, very little competition. So our competition is U.S. based uh, uh, firms that actually want to cut those size checks in Canada. The problem as an entrepreneur is, yes, it's possible to get those big checks outside of Canada, but even the firms in the, in the Valley, uh, what they would prefer is to have a partner, at least one in Canada, that has the boots on the ground that can actually help on a, call it on a daily basis or whatever have you, but really feel the pulse of what's going on. Some will still make an investment without that. But we have found that, that in order to attract some really big dollars, the ability for, for us to cut the big check facilitates the other capital to come in quite significantly. And if I'm an entrepreneur, the wrong answer frankly, from a Canadian perspective, is that I could only go to Omer's Ventures. I love it, but that's not right. Like, you need to keep us honest, and you need to have us be more competitive on that. But I would say to you, even though there's very, very little competition uh, at, at those high levels, the competition 
with the U.S. top-tier firms, they, they are extraordinarily aggressive, and I would, I would never suggest that there is no competition on that level. But frankly, if I was in your shoes, I would like to see a few more uh, Series B plus type firms here. Any other questions? Yes, please. You know, that's a, that's a tough question, and I'll tell you why. Um, you're seeing risk capital, and I call it institutional risk capital. Uh, um, uh, there's a few more players, not a whole ton, um, but there's a few more players in the ecosystem. The source of the capital still is government-related. And the issue is, and you're getting this little pop coming in because of the, 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 the venture capital action plan, you know, the $400 million from the federal government matched by some banks, et cetera. Once that capital gets uh, allocated out, and there is a process of about four years, generally speaking, when that capital goes out, but the total quantum of that capital raised for all the firms largely in Canada is 600 million-ish. 400 from the federal government and there's some, actually it's even a little bit greater than that, maybe it's about 700 or 800 million-ish as I think about it, because I forgot CPBIB. Um, so, so let's just say there's seven or 800 million dollars for all, largely all the venture firms. Just as a comparative, Omer's Ventures has 500 million and we still need to prime the pump. So when I look at $800 million spread amongst a bunch of VC players, that's not very much money. And the key will be, and the pressure is on the VC industry, we collectively better perform and better perform well so that not relying again on public handouts, but starting to get the corporates, the banks, et cetera, back into the asset class so that you actually have sustainable sources of, of investors in order to fund the VC firms. What is very clear is that most countries in the world are having this very same problem with, with some exception in Silicon Valley. And you can't really get uh, investors outside of Canada, so you have to look at your home country. And I would say, while the next few years there's gonna be some capital around, uh, it's, it remains unclear what happens once those allocations are made and where is the future dollar is going to be coming from. Yes, please. John, you talk about the clusters in Waterloo and Toronto and the potential to become a super cluster. Yes. Um, can you elaborate more on what some of the strengths or weaknesses of each, uh, what each region might be? And sure. One or two examples of what is being done or could be done to strengthen that? Sure, great, great. Uh, so, you know, Waterloo, you know, the, 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 the real value of Waterloo, and it's quite, it's recognized, frankly, all over the place. You know, it was kind of funny, uh, first time I met with uh, Mark Andreessen, we were just chatting, and he just said, so, uh, this University of Waterloo, with these engineers, wow, he goes, wow, it's fantastic. Where the hell is Waterloo again? And I said, oh, it's close to Toronto. And it's, it's fascinating to see uh, the engineering talent that Waterloo has been able to brand uh, has been nothing short of spectacular. In the valley, you will hear that uh, when you actually go to Apple and the, uh, Facebook, uh, you start to see the number of Waterloo grads that are in there and they're viewed extre as extremely high quality talent. What's actually happened now is a lot of the uh, folks in the valley in particular talk about Waterloo to get access to the engineers for two reasons. Frankly, it's cheaper. The, the competitive pressures in the Valley is ridiculous. And frankly, there is no loyalty at all. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're basically, you're seeing people moving like crazy. So they love the cost and they love the loyalty of it. Um, Toronto needs access to that amazing supply of, of, of talent. Waterloo needs access to capital. There is no capital of locally based uh, capital. I mean, 
all of the VC firms are are going there. Anyway, we, we, you know, we spend a lot of time there. But having a homegrown VC like Tech Capital was the last one, and they basically made their last investment in 2000 or 2001. And, and that's just one example of what you know, we need in Toronto versus what they need from us uh, in Waterloo. But what is fascinating is that when you look at at least how San Jose and San Francisco, when you start to look at the strengths and weaknesses of that entire region, it was, it was actually an interesting comparative. Uh, Palo Alto had Stanford. Uh, uh, San Jose had manufacturing. You know, water, uh, uh, Kitchener had manufacturing. Toronto has manufacturing. San Francisco has capital. You know, a lot of the banks and wealth management were there. Toronto has that. There was a lot of actual similarities. And not that we're trying to replicate that, but it is fascinating to see uh, use Silicon Valley as an example of different strengths all the way out through the valley. And I think we have something relatively similar, but it's Canadian, it's our own. We're never going to be the same like that. The problem is, as those two nodes are really starting to cluster in and of themselves. So in KW, it's clear, Communitech is the center of the cluster. You can actually see what's happening. What's happening in Toronto, we're still not there, but downtown Toronto is starting to become the center of the clustering. Once we get to a point where you actually have those assets there, the question starts to become, what's the first step of linking? I think it's transportation, okay? Being part of OMER is one of the great things we do. We invest in transportation. Um, so we're looking at, is there an opportunity to, to build a high-speed line that gets you between the two cities in under an hour, you know, ideally 40, 45 minutes? The moment you start talking in there, it starts to make this free flow of people far easier. But one of the issues in Waterloo is they were afraid to deal with Toronto because once the, the folks there started getting access to the clubs, the bars, the restaurants. Who wants to go back to Waterloo if you're single and you don't have a family yet? Like there's, there's not much to do there. When I'm in Waterloo, you know the number one thing I tell them to do is you got to build bars, restaurants, <laughs> cultural things. Keep them there because they love being in the university. They love raising a family. It's the in-between, right? You put in this high speed on there, then you know what? I'm going to stay in Waterloo because I love Waterloo. But you know, I'll go to Toronto for fun, or I go to Toronto to connect to the VCs or the banks, etc. Once you build the transportation infrastructure, I believe you start building data centers around there, housing, um, high speed broadband, etc. The infrastructure around that, but the transportation is the key, and it's no different than the subway line. Is it any secret that the subway line has the most expensive real estate right around it? It's because that's where people move and then all of a sudden people congregate around it. It's gonna be the same theory. So that's one example of the, of the efforts that we're, we're trying to, uh, to, to build around it. It will take time and some pretty big dollars too, but I think, I don't think we have a choice. Yes? Oh, is it, is it good? Great. Well, well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the questions, and uh, have a great day.